Hey everybody, it's Father Andrew, and I'm excited to be back after a few weeks away. I was in the States during Holy Week and Easter, speaking on the Shroud of Turin at various parishes and universities. In fact, recently I, I spoke at Princeton Theological Seminary and Duke and Duquesne. Well, what I want to introduce now is the debate that I had at Duke University with the much-admired uh, Dr. Mark Goodacre, and that's what you're about to see now. So I will comment just a, a couple things at the very end, but without further ado, here's our debate about the authenticity of the Shroud of, of Turin. Enjoy. Gracious sponsoring of our event on the Shroud face-to-face. -face. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Father Juan Jose Hernandez, the director of Duke Catholic Center, who's going to welcome us and open up our event. Thank you, Peter. And it's a good way to begin is to begin in prayer as we delve into our topic this evening. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious Father, giver of all good things, we thank you for this Easter season where we pour once again into our hearts the joy of knowing you, hoping in you, and loving you. We ask you to continue to enlighten our minds to discover more about the person of your son and may that knowledge bring us to love you and may that love bring us to follow you we ask you to bless us this evening as we've gathered here to delve into our topic and in everything we might the knowledge of christ will be poured out into love and in the people you've entrusted to our care to a greater faith and a greater trust in you we ask this in the same christ our lord amen um, we have three, thank you, Father Juan Jose. We have three very distinguished panelists this evening, and I'm going to just give the briefest of introductions right now. We have Robert Orlando, author of Shroud Face to Face and Filmmaker, Father Andrew Dalton from the Legionaries of Christ, a Shroud expert and a professor at the Pontifical Athenaeum Regina Apostolorum in Rome, and our own Mark Goodacre, the chair of the religious studies here at Duke and a professor of New Testament, the Fox, Francis Fox Hill Professor of Religious Studies. But we're gonna do it a little differently. I'm not gonna give you boring introductions of their CVs. We're gonna go directly to a clip. In order to do that, I'm gonna ask Robert Orlando to introduce the clip while I get the lights ready. Yeah, great. So what you're about to see is 12 minutes, which would truly be a sneak peek because no one else has seen this before, but you're going to see Let's call it a rough cut of the opening of the documentary. Stakes in this whole movie. So Robert Orlando is an author and filmmaker. He's uh, dealt with numerous topics from uh, the Divine Plan, Reagan, John Paul II's dramatic end of the Cold War, and a more recent uh, Simon and Schuster book in 2021, Citizen Trump, a one-man show, and extensive studies and documentaries on the Apostle Paul, and is a current doctoral student at Princeton Theological Seminary. Father Andrew Dalton is a Shroud Scholar, uh, teaching at Regina Apostolorum in Rome, the Legionary of Christ University, uh, completed a doctorate recently, I think 2021, uh, on the Pleroma problem in the Gospel of Mark, has extensive New Testament studies, and has started a Shroud, uh, a Shroud Center there for further studies of the Shroud. So we're very grateful to have him. And then of course our own Mark Goodacre, uh, is the chair, as I said, of religious studies and the expert on the world on looking critically at Q and the synoptic problem. If you don't know about Q and the synoptic problem, you're here with a person who can tell you everything you probably ever will need to know about that. But we're not going to go into that today. But uh, we're very grateful to have him here and to share his expertise in New Testament studies. So without further ado, I'll step aside and ask each of you just briefly to tell us what's at stake in this debate. This has been debated since, as we heard, at least the 14th century. Why should we go back to it today? And how did you personally get interested in the show? I think I can try to speak first. Uh, I think for a modern audience, there's a bias, at least over the last generation, probably was there during when I was in college, but over the last generation, which bifurcates science and faith as if they can be separated completely, as if it's there's a possibility that you're almost sort of a higher intellectual order by pushing faith aside and superstition and focusing on the material universe alone. And there is a, a strategy for that, but for me, I've always felt like that line was blurred 
And I thought to myself, um, <clears throat> if, the New if the revelation of God is not just through the New Testament at some past time, but continues in the real creative world, wouldn't the natural order also allow us to learn and discover new things? And could the shroud be that? And if the shroud is that, we have this really incredible possibility to drop something that's in the modern natural order back into our context and narratives of the Gospels. And that was the experiment and the journey I wanted to take. Yeah, to echo that, I think what's at stake here is quite obvious. I'll just share a personal anecdote because just a few days ago, I was presenting at the St. Patrick's <coughs> Cathedral in New York City. And a gentleman who's making a Matt Damon movie um, wanted to interview me on the shroud. We went for three hours talking about this. He's uh, the most, you know, he prided himself to be a man of science, and he's an atheist. And uh, after these three hours, uh, he was then conversing with his friend to say, dang, that's the best propaganda for that Jesus character. That pictures. <laughs> and so, I mean, he wasn't favorable uh, to the result, but there's no doubt that it challenged his, his own preconceptions. Um, and so I, I agree that when you're talking about a historical event, what you're looking for ideally is um, multiple attestation from independent sources. We know this with regard to the documents, right? And that's been the debate thus far, by and large, when you talk about historical Jesus studies. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Tacitus, Suetone, Suetonius, um, Josephus, et cetera. That's, it's about text, see? But what if we have monuments, too? What if we have an archaeological object? What if we have multiple archaeological objects, not just the, the shroud, but also the pseudonym? I think that that's where this um, conversation begins to go, such that we see that it's not faith and faith alone, faith operating against um, reason, but actually reason and faith being like two wings by which the human spirit uh, sends to the truth. That's the opening line of a famous encyclical by Pope St. John Paul II, right? He sees faith and reason <coughs> as mutually illuminating, not as uh, competitive. Yeah, I think I've, in terms of what's at stake, I think I agree with, with that. The, the difficulty when you're doing ancient history is obviously too few sources. When you do modern history, it's the opposite problem, too many sources. And so if the shroud is authentic, it's incredibly exciting because we've got something that's even earlier than the Gospels. I think I used in the, in the trailer to the film, uh, I've forgotten I said this, but I watched the trailer. <laughs> and there's a great bit where, um, where you know, the, the shroud version of, the, sh the shroud face-to-face -face me says that it's like a fifth Gospel. It's like having mm -hmm. a fifth Gospel because it, it obviously, if it's authentic, it's giving us direct access to what happened. And, and since neither Rob nor Father Dole would have mentioned it, it also gives us almost literally the Holy Grail, which is, what did Jesus look like? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is just, I mean, the idea that you might be gazing into the face of Jesus is pretty exciting. And that's why, I mean, and then when, in this, what we've just watched, th thanks for this, Rob, I, I loved watching the, the, the job's split. done, it seems like here. But, um, <laughs> but, um, the, but the, the thing is, again, because you never remember what you say in these things, but well, that was a great I line. can attest that was a great to, line. well, I can attest to that feeling of crushing disappointment when, uh, as a, was I a teenager then? No, I wasn't, I was in my early 20s. Crushing sense of disappointment about the carbon date thing. Okay, now we're going to get into a few of the weeds. Um, we, by prior agreement, we're going to kind of lay out some of the terms of the contemporary debate. So Father Dalton's going to go first. I believe you have a PowerPoint. And we have 15 minutes allotted for, it's usually an hour and 15 minute presentation. <laughs> so this is both condensed, cut. It's like when the professor comes back to you and say, get rid of the two thirds of the paper. This is that version <laughs> of this presentation. And after that, we'll allow Professor Goodacre to, to give a similar presentation, kind of more from the skeptic side. And, and of course, Robert can chime in whenever he wants. All right, I'll try my best. What is the shroud? It's a lot is the starting point. And this is the, for the sake of our conversation, where I want to start tonight to say that I think it's, the, it's a burial shroud, 
that has enigmatic qualities. And these are the five enigmatic qualities that I want to highlight for you, for you now. And I'll try to unpack this. I won't, I won't be able to do it justice, but at least you know the category here. Why, and this is just the biblical, this is not the biblical data, excuse me, this is the scientific empirical data that I think is already the majority report and is really beyond dispute. It's just the data, okay? So what makes the shroud enigmatic? Five points. One, it acts as a photographic document. Two, it's anatomically perfect. The pathology that this man suffered correspond to what we know about the historical Jesus with regard to uh, scourging, crowning with thorns, pierced side, nail wounds in the hands and feet, etc. Okay, anatomically perfect, photographic document. Three, it encodes three-dimensional information unlike any other burial cloth that we know about. So, so much so that we can actually reconstruct a statue based on the contours of the body. This is all derivative from a two-dimensional cloth. Okay, so the cloth is 2D, but information is there that's 3D. We never visualized it until 1976. Four, once we can actually study at, even at the microscopic level of the shroud to understand that the, the image is impressed on the cloth in such a way that it penetrates 200 to 500 nanometers. That's 1 16th or 1 20th the width of a human hair, and we have not a micro laser capable of making a micro burn this precise even to this day. Despite the, sh the fact that the shroud is the most studied archeological object in the history of the world, all attempts to reproduce out artificially in a laboratory have failed. We know what the shroud is not. We don't know what it is. I would like to say this, that the shroud has no signs of decomposition or putrefaction. That's a, a fifth element. So just to rehearse those, and again, I can unpack these further, but just to get a kind of a list, right? So anatomically perfect, photographic document, encodes three-dimensional information, superficiality of the image, and five, no signs of putrefaction or decomposition. Okay, and so all the naturalistic attempts have failed. It's not a painting, it's not a scorch, it's not a rubbing, and it's not a camera oscura. This, the scientists themselves have chimed in upon, okay? So that's the data. Let's explain it, let's accommodate it in one way or another. Of course, the Christian view was that a resurrection took place. And so just for the sake of full disclosure, my personal opinion, it's no dogma, right? We, we, we as Catholics don't have, you know, I believe in God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, oh, and the Shroud of Turin, right? One can think freely about this, and you won't get excommunicated or anything, right? Okay, so I just, but just so you know where I'm coming from here, I think the Shroud is the natural effect of a supernatural event. The event being the resurrection. That, that, that cadaver, uh, the, the body that once lived but now is dead in the tomb, it rises to a new, divinized, glorified state in which it can never die again. And could it be that whatever light effects might have, and I don't pretend to know how to describe such a thing, but if those were the cause for the impression of the image, well then now, now we have a viable theory that I think is unscathed, comparative to those other naturalistic um, explanations that we know fail. All right, so that was Whirlwind's tour. Now, uh, let's see, in the, what do I have here? 12 minutes left? <laughs> um, let's see what I can say. All right, so I think, you know, this needs to be said, while this was the good argument for about 19 years, now it, it fails, and it's a matter of mainstream science that it fails. This needs to be said. As of 2017, a certain researcher by the name of Tristan Casabianca um, actually compelled the original laboratories to disclose the raw data, not the conclusions from which they derived this data, but the individual data that was now available for statisticians and mathematicians to, to study, a, a peer-reviewed scientific journal article, the very archaeometry from Oxford in 1988, that's the institute, that's the publication that said, 95% sure this is, this is a fake. By the way, just to show the sobriety, 1260, which is exclamation point, right? <laughs> and to show just how professional and uh, you know, this, this uh, very humble posture over here in front of these towering pillars. All right, so make of that what you will, but even if they did the best science, we know today that it tells us literally nothing about the rest of the shroud. Why? Because they took a piece from the corner which is known to be, misre it doesn't represent the rest of the shroud. We knew this, by the way, even 10 years prior. In 78, there was a brightness map that was taken of the, the whole cloth. It's all uniform hues of orange and yellow 
But if you go to that top left corner, it's forest green. You could show it literally to a five-year-old who can say, look, mom, that part is different. Do you know the day they're about to cut away eight centimeters of the, the most prized relic in all of Christendom, and they're debating where to take the sample? Two hours, but like, do you think you should have had that figured out? I don't know, 24, day, 24 hours ahead of time, maybe, just a little bit. But no, they, they, they took it from the worst possible spot. Now, there are different reasons why that spot might be different, but be that as it may, the bottom line is, it tells us nothing of the rest of the shroud. It's anomalous, it's heterogeneous, it's not like the rest of the cloth. Okay, so, and, and that's not my opinion, it's a matter of mainstream science at this point. And so, I don't think that that should be used, anyway. at least if you're a scientist worth your salt, I don't think you should even mention this anymore. Secondo Pia is, this is the watershed in shroud science, the year is 1898, he's using new technology, 60 years prior, the first cameras are invented, and this is, this is the face of the man of the shroud as it's seen on the, on the linen itself. Can you imagine his surprise when he sees the photo negative for the first time to see that? Look, look just, just for a moment, imagine you never saw that as Christians for some 19th century or so. Where would you see the outlines of the eyes? Like, isn't it true that you would it's easy to imagine a kind of uh, Bart Simpson figure here with the boundaries of the eyes are, are like bug eyes, right? Huge because you could interpret those white spaces as the outlines of the eyeballs themselves. Look now at so many icons that depict Jesus in exactly this way down through the centuries. I can point out some 13 to 15 other characteristics that are very counterintuitive to the artist, by the way. A triangle between the eyebrows, a U shape in that same space, a, a, a line across the throat. Look at the line across the shroud. In other words, what I'm suggesting is that the attributes that we see here are reproduced again and again in so many icons because they're following a prototype. They're following an image that is, is not artwork. And so they dare not deviate from the enshrined norm because this isn't uh, just some artist's whim here. But when you look for the photo negative, you realize that it's anatomically perfect. Look now to the sockets around the eyes. Can you see the subtle contours that, that make good sense? Those aren't the, the outlines of the eyeballs themselves. No, no, these are, this corresponds to a human body. You can see the subtle details between the lips, the separation there at the lips and the, the beard, the inflammation in the cheeks. Uh, I'm gonna get into some of those details if uh, time, perm time permits. Um, these are some of the icons that, some date back to the, the sixth century, the Pantocrator in Mount Sinai uh, is, it comes to mind. This one in the center is from Cefalu in Sicily, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's, it's from 1145, 1160. And then finally, it's in Athens that you see in the 11th century, um, the church of Daphne, near Athens, right? Okay, so what if we are to use modern technology, um, or at least we're not in 1898 anymore. This is Eric Jumper and John Jackson of the United States Air Force Academy, who used the VP-8 image analyzer to visualize the shroud in a brand new way. I'll spare you the details. The bottom line is that they're the first to notice that 3D information is encoded in a 2D cloth. And when they visualize, well, they visualize this, it, the highest powered laboratories in America, 20 of them, come together to answer this question. What formed this enigmatic image? It's not at all a religious question at this point. There are atheists and agnostics and Jews and Protestants and Catholics on this team. They go overseas with 80 crates of the most state-of-the-art equipment to answer that one question, they come home with more questions than answers. Because all the, the theories that were on the table are now discarded. They know it's not a painting because there's no paint, organic or inorganic, no varnish, no dye, no ink, no brush strokes, no directionality with it, which color is impressed upon the cloth. And so they conclude it's not artwork. See how they phrase it? They don't tell you what it is, they tell you what it's not. From an empirical point of view, all you can say is, I don't know what formed the image. End of story. That's as far as that discourse can go, okay? And so what I'm, I wanna suggest is that the Christian has every right to step into that space and say, I've got an alternative. And uh, that's that this was created by the resurrection itself. A certain physicist by the name of Paolo de Lazzaro spent five years trying to colorize a linen just by using light. He played with the variables, amplitude, frequency, duration of exposure, 
and he settles on UV X-ray laser. And this, what he's able to calculate is how much energy would be required to colorize a cloth of this size. And his conclusion is that you would need 34 trillion watts. But not just, it's not just a matter of an astronomical quantity of, of energy, it's the amount of time in which it is unleashed upon the cloth. And the, and, and the proposal that the scientists are giving us is 40 um, billions of a second. Okay, because evidently you don't have a crater the size of Nagasaki or Hiroshima in Jerusalem, that, that energy is released and now it's there and it's gone. Okay, and so when you hear, in a question around Easter time, top 10 religious fakes in the shroud is up there one, two, and three. Look, if this is artificial, artificially produced, <coughs> let's just reproduce it. How about that? Do you know that there are many who have tried, but they don't agree amongst themselves. Like, look, if it's a rubbing, it's not a scorch. If it's a scorch, it's not a camera oscura. It, 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 pick one, right? But it's not all of these things. Um, and there's, there's no consensus view about how this, uh, how this was created. I'm gonna skip a lot here. Um, I want to I want to point out some of the details here. With regard to the scourge marks, what we find is that there is some rhyme and reason. Imagine on the theory that this is the work of a con artist in fabricated in France in the Middle Ages. I want you to see that the scourge marks show that everything, all the scourge marks that land towards the mid body range are at a perpendicular angle whereas those that strike towards the feet or towards the head are always at an oblique angle. There are two lictores, two men scourging, one on either side, but they're pivoting. They're standing still and towards the hand, head and towards the feet, it's always, there's always an angle, there's an arc, is what I'm trying to suggest to you. But there's, but there's two men, one's on the other side, and he's scourging in the same way. But one man's arc is a little longer, one, man, one radius is a little longer, but it's consistent, and so, um, it seems to me that you'd have to imagine that someone went through this exercise and said, hey, let's make sure there's some method to the madness so that if in 700 years somebody you know, draws circles around all these scurdy marks, they see that it's not haphazard, it actually makes good logical sense. The, the crowning of thorns is surprising too because we see, not, it's not a ringlet, it isn't always the case that in our churches and in our holy images, it's kind of like a wreath. Can you really imagine a centurion taking three and a half hours making this beautiful braid? Isn't it much more likely that he made just a lot, uh, just a, a mess of thorn, maybe a wicker branch to put it all together? Here's a reconstruction of what we, from the shroud, what seems to be the case. Um, we even could suggest the Zisa Vespina Christi, here the Latin name is Thorns of Christ, quite literally. But the flows of blood here, there's a very high concentration of blood vessels here at the head. We have some 30 to 50 little flows of blood showing that this, this covers the whole surface of the head. It doesn't seem likely that a con artist would present something so unlike what we're used to seeing. If he wants to convince people, this is the real McCoy, see? Also, the, uh, with regard to the crucifixion, the nail wound, this is one I want, the nail wounds are not in the palms, which is exactly what you might have expected, right, if you're, you're looking again to our, to our churches, to our holy images. Instead, it's in the wrist. In, it's in Z space or Destas space, right between the metacarpals. A certain French surgeon in the 1930s does this experiment. His name is Pierre Barbet. He writes a book called A Doctor at Calvary. He was afraid to put the nail, wound, the nail here because he was afraid he'd break a bone. And if you know the scriptures, Jesus is the Passover lamb, not a bone shall be broken. He said, well, I don't know, let's just try. He takes a nine inch nail with a square cross section and he drives it in to that space, it's called a thenar furrow, just under this muscle in the thumb. Um, and what happens every single time is that it creates an anatomical path. The pointed uh, nail goes through this bundle of bones, they reconfigure, and, and the result is you're very securely fastened to the cross. Do you know that if you try to put the nail wound in the center of the hand, after just 10 minutes, even with half the weight of a human body, you know what happens. It just, it just rips right through. It could not have been the case. Uh, historically speaking, it just, do you know that there were some 600 crucified along the Via Appia? <laughs> At one point, the, the Romans knew to crucify effectively. They wouldn't have put it in the palms. The shroud shows us something much more credible, even if our images, and even if the con artist would be less inclined to put it there. These are, these are just some elements. One is wh where there's um, soil. 
I should mention that there's soil at the feet, at the knee, at the tip of the nose. This is soil we can put it under a microscope. We can determine its chemical composition. We know it is calcium carbonate with a touch of strontium. We know even its um, crystalline structure to be travertine aragonite, which is a very rare crystalline structure, and yet it matches the soil of the grottoes of Jerusalem like a fingerprint, says one geologist. So if, it, if it's not, if it's not from Palestine, what's it doing with Palestinian soil? Right where you'd expect contact with the ground. Something similar with the pollen, by the way. We have some 120 plus of the of a certain species of plant called the Gundelia turniforzi. Not one or two. 120 plus, and it just so happens that it blossoms in April and May in a radius of about five or 20 kilometers within in Jerusalem. So it's the cumulative force of, of all of these things. I don't think there's any one argument, but together I think they make a very strong case. I want to say one last word, and I know I need to close up my time, is the, the pierced side. It's important because, look, if we made a list of all the men who were crucified and crowned, one man makes that list, Jesus of Nazareth. If we make a list of all those who were um, crucified and pierced in the side, one man makes that list. What's the probability that this is someone else, this, this unique combination of sufferings? But do you know that the wound is between the fifth and sixth rib? We're talking a distance of about 10 centimeters or three and a half inches to the heart. It's a double-edged blade, corresponds to the Roman lancea, four centimeter wound that is here. Outflow blood and water, says the evangelist John. Do you know we can't see water with the naked eye? We see the blood stain, right? But we don't see evidence of the water. But in 1978, these STIR scientists, they're not looking with the naked eye. And they see, when you look at ultraviolet fluorescence, that is to say, what's, when you can capture the chemical composition on the cloth, there's evidence not just of the corpulous blood, but also of the serous blood. In other words, it's not just any blood stain, it's post-mortem blood. He was already dead when they pierced the side and outflowed this kind of blood. More on that on the Q&A if you want, but again, I think that you have to see here that this evidence, if, if this is the work of a con artist, he evidently killed a guy in order to get this blood stain because this is human blood, it is male blood, and it is AB, at least according to some forensic doctors. More recently, Dr. Kelly Kirst, an immunologist here, actually in this area, he might be in Tennessee actually, um, he says that we might have to do further tests to, to prove that it's AB. But um, can you imagine, this isn't the, the blood of a, a, a goat or a cat or a dog or something. This is human blood, and it's post-mortem human blood. And so somebody died. I say, if this is the work of a con artist, he is so good, um, maybe we need to be worshiping him. <laughs> so that's the case that I would make. Again, naturalistic attempts to explain this image fail, and that leaves room for this to be the natural effect of a supernatural event. Thank you, Father Dalton. All very fascinating. Uh, Professor Goodacre. Please, you can either use this mic or your own mic. Yeah, why not? Yeah, it's over here. Uh, Dr. I'm not joking when I say that I'm a reluctant skeptic. I really do want to believe. I was a child in 1978 when my parents took me to see the film. It was called The Silent Witness. And it did the whole story of the shroud. And as a child, I was absolutely, I think that might be the moment that I became genuinely interested in the New Testament. So I've got a lot to be grateful for, the shroud. I think that was what, because it makes you think, what if this is true? What, what if this is historical? That's what that film made me think as a child. And even though I am regretfully persuaded that it's not true, that it's not authentic, it, the questions are still real. And as Father Dalton rightly pointed out, it's not in any creed that you have to believe in the Shroud of Turin, so we can at least you know, part friends. I, 
We'd like to begin with where, do we say Father Dalton or Father Andrew? I say Father Adrian. Father, Father Andrew, I say <laughs> Father Andrew, that's nice. Uh, so I'd like to begin where Father Andrew began, which is with John's Gospel. So John 20 gives the story of Jesus' resurrection, just following up from the end of John 19, where Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus buried Jesus. Now what John the Evangelist actually says is that there were ophthonia, which is the Greek plural word meaning small linen cloths. In other words, and then twice it comes again in chapter 20, when the resurrection has happened, you see these orthonia again. Now, the primary bit of evidence, therefore, that you would want to align with the shroud, John's Gospel, is actually wanting at that point. It does not describe a one-piece shroud wrapped around Jesus' body. It refers to small linen cloths. And that's why usually, if you look at most translations, they'll go linen cloths, linen clothes, they'll sometimes even say small linen cloths, this kind of thing. So it doesn't seem to be depicting a burial shroud. Father Andrew also mentioned that this is an amazing archeological artifact. I don't think it is an archeological artifact at all. An archeological artifact is usually something that is dug up somewhere, but even according to the story of the shroud, it's not something that was ever buried and rediscovered. It was something that was supposedly around for 2,000 years or so, passed from one person to another to another. If you read Ian, Wilson, if you read Ian Wilson's book on the Turin Shroud, he'll tell you what he thinks the journey of the shroud is from the first century to the present. The point is an important one because archeologists have found a burial shroud from the first century from Jerusalem in situ, in a Jerusalem tomb from this date, and it doesn't look anything like the Turin Shroud. It's completely different. And lots of people haven't really sort of put this Turin Shroud together with the authentic Jerusalem Shroud from the first century. It's disappointingly different. The origin of the Shroud, I think, is not the first century. It's not tomb in Jerusalem. The origin of the shroud we actually know. It's from the 14th century, and in the clip we saw, Dale Allison mentions that we do actually have some very, very good documentation of the origins of the shroud. There was a bishop called, uh, he was, he, he's, a, he's a bishop who, who writes to the Pope, and called Henri had done an investigation, had found the guy who painted it, who actually produced it, who confessed to doing it. Now, Father Andrew's reasons for thinking it to be authentic are the same reasons that I think it's not. I don't think it is anatomically perfect. I've spent ages staring at the hands. I think the hands are wrong. Have another look at that. They don't look like human hands. Those fingers are not human fingers. Put, if you get a life-size version of the shroud and put your hand next to that, it doesn't look like. They act what it does look like is the way that people used to depict Jesus in the medieval period, with fingers like that. The thing that does give me pause is the nails in the, in the wrists. That is fascinating. And it certainly seems to be medically correct that if you nail somebody in the wrists rather than in the palms of the hands, that the person could stay up on the cross. The reason why that's not a slam dunk, well, there's two reasons why I think that's not a slam dunk. The first is that we don't know that people were nailed through the wrist in antiquity. There's no other evidence for it. In fact, the only archaeological evidence we've got for a crucified victim is from first century Jerusalem. He's, he's, he's called Yehohanan. And Yehohanan uh, has the, there's an there's a ankle bone with a nail through it, but the um, arm and hand bones don't have any um, nails in them. So he was probably tied to the cross. And that means that even if you were nailed through the hands, you could still be tied as well. A bit like if you're, if you're a film buff like me, then you would have seen in Jesus of Nazareth, they tie Jesus, Rob Pell, and then they nail him through the hands. So in a way, it, it's not a slam dunk that isn't about the nail, but also it's, uh, Antonio Lombati has argued that it is not trying to depict a nail going through the wrist anyway. It's just that the, ana the anatomy of the hands isn't very well done on the shroud, 
and the artist is trying to put the nail through the palm of the hand, but actually has kind of missed by it a bit. I'm not sure whether that's true or not, but um, I think the, the nailing through the hand argument is really not quite there. I wonder about the cogency of the, if it's a fake, reproduce it, because there are, it is, one thing that's doing is tempting fate a little bit, because there are lots of people who have attempted to reproduce it, some of them quite well. Um, there's, there's several books that are well worth um, taking a look at who have attempted reproductions. Paul Grandry alludes to that by saying that different people think it was done differently, they can't all agree. Well, that was never, that was never an argument for authenticity. Someone's arguing for the authenticity of an object can't legitimately say, all my opponents disagree with me, because that's just, that's just the nature of scholarship. We all disagree all the time about all sorts of things. So, back to John 20 again, and the linen cloths. What's so disappointing about that is that the argument for the authenticity of the shroud is based on how close it is to the gospel record. Crown of thorns, the piercing on the side, the scourging, the nails. So the whole argument is based on the idea that the Turing shroud is remarkably similar to the descriptions that you've got in the gospels. And if you want to push that argument, then you have to take seriously what John's Gospel says, which is that Jesus was not buried in a shroud like the one at Turin, but was buried with linen cloths, and it was the linen cloths that were left when he was raised from the dead. All right, we have a debate. So please, uh, I'll ask our two presenters to come up. Uh, we're almost at the hour in which case we'll open up the Q&A, but let's give Father Dalton and Robert, if you like, uh, a few minutes for, you know, in good scholastic fashion, respondeo, ad unum ad unum, so forth. But just, just, just two or three minutes if you'd like to make a response, and, and I'll uh, allow you to do the same thing, Robert, but if you want to make a, a count response. So we're going to open up the questions very quickly. First of all, thank you. That was, that was brilliant, and I think all of that is perfectly reasonable, and I, this is the kind of debate we want. So, um, I was going to start by saying, Ophelia, um, do you know, we need to compare John with Luke. The, Luke is the only one who uses both words. If you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what you're going to find is the word syndon in Greek, which is shroud. It's the very word that appears in Mark when the young man, the Neoniscos, goes off naked, remember, with the arrest, and in order to save his skin, he slips out of his, whatever that sheet, like, I guess it was big enough to cover his body. That's a syndon. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke use that word. Significantly, Luke uses both words. Tri look when you have the time. Read the end of chapter 23 and the beginning of 24. And what I think is clear is that the word othonia, uh, which is plural, um, contains in it the winding sheet, the syndrome. Now, why, how do we know that? Well, look to one, two elements that we see are from the, from the scientists themselves. The American scientists note that there is a depression in the beard and a crease around the legs. Okay, so it seems that in addition to the long sheet that goes above and below the body, in order to keep the mouth shut, perhaps there was a strap that kept, you know, after rigor mortis relaxes, in order to avoid a gaping wide open mouth, they, a strap of sorts. More convincingly still to my mind is the strap that goes around the legs. Do you know that if you look to the frontal image and you compare it to the dorsal image, it seems the man from the front is taller than the man on the back. And the reason for that is because there's a fold between the ankles and the knee. And what, what, what caused this fold? It seems that a strap, a strap that tied together such that, again, once rigor mortis relaxes, it, it doesn't sink. This is particularly clear because the buttocks are curved. It's not like fingers, you know, soft tissue pressed against a window pane that pressed flat. There's, the chin is so close to the sternum because as he was hanging on the cross, so his body, is, so his head is raised because the body is still in this cadaveric rigidity that sets in after death, but lasts no longer than forty hours. Then the body begins to relax and decompose. None of that happened on the shroud. Okay, so I think we have good reason to believe, especially if you can consider um, John chapter eleven, where Lazarus is raised from the tomb. If you'll remember, what Jesus says as he comes out is, "Unbind him." 
Evidently, there's something to unbind. Could it be the case that that Jesus was wrapped in such a way and John saw, he was there on Friday night, he was at the foot of the cross. Now he's back on Sunday and he sees, and when he sees, because he sees what he sees, the way that he sees it, he saw and believed. And so could it be that he saw those, those, claws, those clothes with the, the strips on the outer ends, and now he sees it, and there's only one descriptor. There's no adjectives, it's a participle, but it says that it's lined. Go to your different translations, it's actually quite funny. In Spanish, they add extra words. They say it's lying on the ground, but in the Greek, it doesn't say on the ground. It says, rather, just lying, and I think that means lying flat. In, in other words, because there's no contents inside the cloth, the, the, the cloth collapses. And imagine if there's enclosing strips on the outer, on the end on the outside, all the more reason that, that John would want to highlight the fact that it's lying. He also adds, oh, and the sudanium, the piece that covered the head, it's rolled up or folded up on the side. Evidence that Jesus, having exited the inside of the winding sheet, now is capable of, I don't know, folding his clothes and off he goes. But my point is that it's what he saw, the way that he saw it, there's, it's not despite um, the visual cues, it's in light of the visual cues. And they're exactly consonant with what we see on the shroud. There's no, I don't think there's, if you, if you were to imagine mummy strips, yes, that's ridiculous. That's a really bad, by the way, NIV translation of Othonia is strips. Um, that should be discarded in my mind. You need to accommodate all the data and looking at um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, especially Luke, uh, I think we have every reason to that uh, it's a, a long sheet together with the straps. Sorry for the long answer. No, no that's good. <laughs> professor, well, do you want to go next? Well, then Professor, professor Goodacre, and then I'll give uh, Robert the last word before we open it up. But just one very quick counter, counter question. So does the Sudarium have Jesus's image on it as well? It has blood stains. thanks for the question. There's blood stains <laughs> that are amorphous, but th- this sheet is about yay big. It's folded in half. It's pressed to a face such that when it moves from the vertical position to the horizontal position after you take the nails out of the hands, uh, out from the nose and mouth flow uh, a lot of blood. And so this blood is like uh, soaking into the beard, and so we get this double facial image. And if you look to the literature of a certain Alejandro Hermosillo, who in the, he had, there's a center of shroud studies in Valencia, and they have uh, these fascinating studies where you superimpose the blood stains on the on the sudanium over that of the man on the shroud, and though these are amorphous shapes in some very impressive ways to my mind, they coincide. One comes to mind, do you remember that three, reverse three-shape rivulet that's here at the, the forehead? And then there's a little globby just under it. Not only do these align, but what's, if it's uh, like a rim on the shroud that leaves the center empty, it, as, as they come one over the other, what's empty in the one is filled in the other. Um, To my mind, it's a very strong argument that two claws covered one and the same body. And it just so happens that the blood stain there is a B. It's also that it's also the proportion of blood to water is something like one to six. Was it six to one, I suppose? One to six? Anyway, it's lung edema that they say. So someone who's been brutalized by by flagellation would experience just this kind of thing. So um, also on the, with regards to the blood stains, supercharged with bilirubin, such that ancient blood usually turns black. But when uh, supersaturated with bilirubin, again, an effect of the scourging, it leaves ancient blood to stay red. This is what convinced my Jewish friend, Barry Schwartz, who's the webmaster of Shroud.com, to be convinced that this is authentic. After 19 years of holding out skeptically, he said, this is just too much, I have to give in. He's not a Christian to this day. He just says, by the, the force of the empirical evidence alone, we have to ascribe this, attribute this clause to this historical person, Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, they do this super imposition on um, the CNN show, Finding Jesus. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they do the super imposition. Uh, but why, why is there, sorry, I'm just, but yeah, why, right. that, why, why is there no picture of Jesus on the Sudarium then? Well, it seems Did it go through that cloth onto the other one. I, I, I don't think the sudanium was in contact with the body at, in the moment of the burial. So I think it was used in the moment that the, the body's deposed right. from the cross. But it seems to me that it's only interesting. It's only that which is in contact with the body. There's reason to believe this. So think of this: if you're if you're a con artist, what would you be inclined to do? Paint the body first and then add the blood stains, or might you begin with the blood stains and then add the body? I think it's quite clear you'd start with the body so that you'd say, like, hey, there's the hands, let's add the, uh, let's add the blood stains in the right spot. 
because you know that all this runs the exact opposite. And we know this because if you look to the blood stains, they act as normal blood stains. The moment the body is in contact with the cloth, Friday night, according to the biblical narrative, like it begins to transfer from the cadaver to the cloth as it resoftens by a process called fibrinolysis, and then the blood can transfer from the body to the cloth. Okay, so that starts first. But it seems that in the second moment, could it be the resurrection? The, 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 the image is impressed. And we know this because underneath the blood stain, guess what? There is no coloration of the fibers below. And so it seems that the blood stain is acting as sunscreen, if I can use the analogy, right? You ever like try to put sunscreen on, you miss that spot in the middle of your back, and then after three hours in the sun, you realize you're white all over, but like a tomato right in the center of the back? In other words, where the, where the blood is not protecting the fibers, from a, a secondary moment of coloration, there there's no coloration there. But where where the where the blood stain is not, uh, where the blood stain is, is not protecting, uh, excuse me, I think I said that backwards. Where the blood stain is not protecting the cloth, there it, there is a micro burn, if you like. Where the blood is, it's protected. So the, the blood isn't is isn't a photo negative. It's just a blood stain. But it's the body image that's the photo negative. Think of that. Nineteen centuries after the invention of photography. It, we have this, excuse me, 19, 19 centuries before the invention of photography, we have a photographic effect. And how is that possible? Again, the, the starting point is still on, it goes unexplained, remember. The biblical, the, not, the empirical data is, this enigmatic image is there. It has these characteristics. We've been unable to explain them. Leave aside even the, the, the question yeah. of reproducing it, but it needs to be explained. Excuse me. Thank you. Robert, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, small point to, to my understanding from my research is that it's possible that also the face linen was left for Friday night, but when they came back, they put the full linen because they left. That's how they would leave the body. I don't know. I can't argue beyond that, but that's where I left off as how to explain that fact. Um, I have the advantage as a storyteller to live in narrative, so um, I don't have to be didactic all the time, but what I hear when I hear great debates like this at some point is, you have to weigh you know, the implausibility of some of the arguments against others and give it weight. And, and for me, even when I heard this very debate and read and wrote my book, I came away thinking the plausibility was still leaning in to not be skeptical. There was enough to find at each <coughs> step. And even for these five points, I thought they were so significant and were without another explanation as weighty as the, the possibility of the light of the resurrection. So it makes you think that someone should do a crime novel movie of it. Well, 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 well uh, Dr. Goodacre said during our interview, it's either, it's either Jesus rose from the dead or an evil genius. And I remember he said, <laughs> because I, I, I paint too, and I know what it would take to create something like that. And the detail level is incredible. I mean, Wonderful. <laughs> OK, who wants to weigh in? Please, tell us your name, and then ask your question. Wait, could you repeat the question? Do you want to, do you want Why to don't they just date again the shroud? I think they will, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if it happens in our lifetime, at least if we do our job right. But what needs to happen, it seems to me, is that the scientific community needs to come to a consensus about how to do this. Because this is exactly what took place in the first moment in, uh, it was Cardinal Ratzinger, if I'm not mistaken, who was at the head of the CDF at the time, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. And he asked for these protocols to come in from the different laboratories so that they might be agreed about how to advance in these, in these studies. Originally, it was supposed to be seven different samples, seven different laboratories. Independently, they were to produce their own results. None of this happened. It got reduced to three and then to one sample. And then they, it, it got divvied up into Arizona and Oxford and Zurich. <coughs> but instead of publishing independently, they published together a lump sum. It's just, if you want to get into it, there's a uh, there's a documentary called La Notte della Sindone in Italian that kind of even interviews this, a documentary style. There's also a book by a certain Joe Marino who details exhaustively the whole thing. But you can imagine the embarrassment, and you, you described well the, the sinking disappointment that, that came. Imagine the feeling if you were the bishop in, in Torino there to, the, the, to have exposed this and then, huh. It seemed to be a fake. And so nobody wants to repeat that story. Um, and so if it's going to happen again, I think it has to be these international centers saying, we're agreed about how to go about this. Holy Father, would you please consider doing this again? 
Because now it's in his hands. Back then it wasn't, right? Well, in 1978 with his turf team, it was the, that of the royal family, the Savoy family. But it was bequeathed in 1983 to Pope St. John Paul II, and it's the, he who sits in the chair of Peter that owns, so that's Pope Francis now. So we'll have to see if he could be convinced to say, sure, do more tests. Robert has a quick response. Yeah, quick. Yeah. Oh, did, you, did you have something to add there? Okay, so the, uh, I interviewed Dr. Emanuela, Emanuela Mar Marinelli, uh, who wrote 23 books or participated in 23 books. I'm not sure. How, I don't know how you do that, but um, but she had one other thing, and it's a general general um, comment, but I think it covers a lot of the ground here. <clears throat> she said the reason why carbon dating is no longer the most effective way to do this is that you have to you have to concede that the whole shroud is exposed to the environment it's in. So the reading, there are pollutants that are going to affect all of the shroud. I thought that was a significant additional layer to, that's why they're seeing it as a weak final conclusion about the shroud in her studies, in her research. All right. Anything else on carbon dating? Yeah. All right. Uh, I don't know who was next. Well, let's tell us your name and your question. Olivia, um, I wanted to ask about the letter from the bishop to the pope. Do we have any research or like any evidence of any follow-up on that? Like, did they end up seeking out the person who confessed to it or anything regarding that? No, he, um, the, the, the I, I, was, I, was, I was thinking of quoting it. Uh, so, so it, let, let me just quick, quickly quote a bit from the, from, from the piece. <coughs> Eventually, after diligent inquiry and examination, he discovered the fraud. This is talking about the bishop. He discovered the fraud and how the said cloth had been cunningly painted the truth being attested by the artist who had painted it, to wit that it was a work of human skill and not miraculously wrought or bestowed. And the date of that is probably around 1389, something like that. Um, so it, it, I tend to find that, I mean, you might correct me, um, either of you, I tend to find that the evidence from that RP letter is generally either played down or ignored by shroud experts. They generally prefer to go to the first century, but with any piece, you, you can look at the Gospel of Jesus' wife, which is now universally agreed to be a forgery. You go to the accompanying documentation. You, go, you, you see what that says. You see if that helps you with provenance. That's right, you should do that. And I think, though, you also have to accommodate all the data. And a book in my hand, I think, is a picture of the Hungarian Prey Codex, which dates, we know, to 1192 to 1195. That's a very slim window, um, and it's very precise. There's also there's not only uh, words, but there's also musical notation that makes it a very sure uh, date to this particular comic strip from the 12th century, we might say. But can you just notice for a moment, in the, in the top scene, you see the men coming to bury the body of Jesus, see the halo that has a cross on it. This is most certainly Jesus that's depicted there. You'll notice his hands are folded in just the way that you see on the shroud. In fact, there are only four fingers. Most of us has five, I'm pretty sure, but it just so happens that on the shroud, you don't see the thumbs. It seems that he's copying the shroud. See that the cloth is under the body in the top scene? But then that's not it. There's a second scene in the comic strip. In scene two, the women are coming now. See their flasks? They're coming to anoint a body that isn't there. And the angel says, why do you look for the living amongst the dead? He's, he's not here, he's been raised. And so you see the cloth, the same one that's in scene one, except now you see, now look, more details, right? Can you see the herringbone weave, these diagonal lines that, that converge in this, in this way? It's exactly what we see on the Shroud of Turin. And so not only that, but we have the poker holes. But you see in the shape of a seven, one, two, three, four holes. So if you come three quarters down like the length of the body, in the same position and orientation as on the shroud, you see these holes on the Hungarian prey codex. See the four holes that are here? There's no doubt, even the most skeptical people understand that the, this particular prey codex corresponds to that shroud, which today is called the Shroud of Turin. Even if in 1192, of course, it wasn't in Turin. And there's no justification, mind you, about oh, let me explain what this is a picture of. It's clear that it's just receiving a tradition at this point that is, how long has it been held? I mean, you can just kind of plainly show it and no need to explain that, oh, this is the burial shroud of Jesus. Hey, guys, this isn't a fake, let me prove it to you. No, it's just, it's assumed, it seems, it seems to me. So at least as old as that. Now, see, I know it's not the kind of evidence 
that Dr. Goodinger wants and many others, we want uh, letters like we have in Liray in France in 1354. But what about evidence like this? And what about those icons? And what about the blood that coincides with, and with the provenance of this Udagi, by the way? So it says it's 600. So if you think that uh, coincides with one and the same man, you have to say it's at least as old as that. So could we maybe put a little question mark on that, on that um, one letter? It may just be that someone thought it to be fabricated in this way. But if we can't generate it even now with all the technology, anything remotely close, especially at the microscopic level, to my mind, that needs to be taken into consideration and kind of put, held at arm's length. Robert, I was going to add, in, in my journey through this content, this content um, the letter was really strong to me because it stood out. And I know the historian me wants to have the text. The science the scientist me was weighing the, the narrative, the storyteller. But I thought when you get to correspondence about the shroud in general, as to how the church uh, testified or, or the owners of the shroud testified, and you read the communications, it got pretty blurry for me pretty quickly about what was the standard authoritative view of what it was. So collect individually, that was the strongest against the shroud. But collectively, I felt like there were, you couldn't quite nail down an, an opinion that was lasting about what was the view of the shroud from a point of authority as you go back into that muddy time where we don't know exactly what it was. So did, can I just add one quick yeah, thing on, on that? The, the reason why, much nicer pronunciation, <laughs> <laughs> um, the reason why we know that, it's the, that that is the, what we now call the Turin shroud is that there's a medallion that dates from this same period, and it actually shows the shroud being um, being shown in public, and it looks like the Turin shroud. So it's we've not only got the letter, but we've also got the medallion. I think it's in it's in Museum France now. Do we have that? Okay. Other question from France. Okay. Um, just to follow up on that, what is the oh Patrick? Sorry, um, is there any? Clear link between that medallion that you just mentioned and Lire, or is are they? Yeah. Okay. Is it? How so? I think it was. It was found there. I think wasn't it? It was fished out of the River Seine. Right. You know, like, can you imagine yeah. if it fished like centuries later? Yeah. But you know, if you went on a pilgrimage, you would have to show. Look, I did it. Here's my stamp of approval, right? And your little pin. And it has the empty tomb in the center. It has the family crest of Gifflois and his wife. And then above that, um, the full length of the shroud with the dorsal image, the herringbone weave. Mm -hmm. And so it clear, it passed down through the ancestors of the Duchamp family until they ran out. And then it got sold for two castles, I think it was. And so, um, so we know, nobody has any doubt from 1354 onwards, we know every baby step of the shroud. Um, the question is, where was it prior to that? The image on the medallion is much stronger than what we see as well. So it may be evidence that the image used to look much stronger that it's faded over the centuries. Do you have the image of the, of the crowd holding the shroud out in, a, in public? Do you have that one? That's one? I thought this was so significant because where they took the fringe sample from is related to this picture because you could see how they would hold it and it was an active icon. So they would use it for processions and parades. And the very place where they took the sample from would be where all the hand holding would come from, where the most bacteria would possibly accumulate, and you'd get a misreading. Or it was used so much that they would have to patch the fringes to some degree, so you're getting a foreign element. And what was it called? The French weave? What was the, the French invisible weave. The French invisible weave, where they collect it back, but try and do it in a way where you couldn't see what was being added. Can I, can I tell that story? Sure. Because I think it's a really good one. Sue Benford is a librarian. She's not a scientist, but she's watching TV and she sees the picture of the man of the shroud and says, that's Jesus. I want to study this thing. And so she gets magnified pictures of the weave from that corner and shows it to textile experts. And without even knowing what they're looking at, they say one after another, wow, this is interesting. This is The weave is misaligned. And so she researched this. And you can find books on this from the 16th century. French invisible weave, what would you do? Instead of putting cloth one against cloth two and putting a nasty weave in between or a seam, what you would do is unravel the threads on either side and then you would do what's called a splice. You would put, you would put one side of the thread together with the other side of the thread. But what if this new cotton material in relation to the rest of this old cloth is more white as opposed to the yellowed oxidized cloth, right? Well, you would add a plant gum. The plant gum would be received by the cotton fibers, but not by the oxidized um, linen. 
and so it'd be more uniform. But you, now you've introduced new organic material from the 16th century. So she writes a paper and presents it at an international congress in Orvieto in Italy, and it gets published on Shroud.com, and it catches the attention of a certain Ray Rogers, who's the head chemist of Stern. And he calls up Barry Schwartz and says, what are you doing publishing on our scientific website a paper from the lunatic fringe, he says. And he says, well, Ray, I think she follows the, uh, the scientific method. It's an interesting theory. I think the community at large ought to know about it. He says, I'm going to prove her wrong in five minutes. He says, well, Ray, go ahead. They hang up the phone. He goes to his little manila folder. Ray Rogers was there in 70. He went home with a, a sample of the adjacent cloth right by the, where they used the uh, the, for the testing in 88, and he, he, he scours it with his microscope, etc. He calls back 90 minutes later to, uh, to say to Barry, I'm, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think she's right. Not only is there linen, the, the cloth is 100% linen, but in that corner, they have found cotton. Do you know Ray Rogers is racing against the clock because he has cancer, if I'm not mistaken. He publishes in Thermochemica Octa, I think this is in the year 2005, and he promotes, he shows this particular theory, now gives it more scientific uh, credibility by publishing in a peer-reviewed scientific journal article, and then it's, uh, he dies. He gives that very sample and that splice to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Los Alamos, Los Alamos Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and they, they see not only the splice, they also show that where there was the intersection of one, uh, one thread over another, now when you um, separate them, you can actually see a white band uh, and then it's yellow left and right of that intersection. Why? Because where the, 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 the weave doesn't allow for the plant gum to be absorbed, it's left uh, pristine. And so it seemed to um, substantiate the claims that were being made even prior to his, his death. And now, now this is a matter of, I, I think this is, I think just further evidence that shows that that French invisible weave is, is a good theory. But I would want to highlight that even if you reject all of that, it would still be just as true that having tested that area, it would still be anomalous. Whether it's because of French invisible weave, because it's a contaminants from a fire or some fungus of some sort, uh, accommodate it as you wish, but it's still heterogeneous vis-a-vis -vis the research. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. Um, um, hi, this was a great treat. My name is Kirsten. I'm a PhD student in biology, so the blend of faith and science was extremely interesting to me, um, and I think the shroud just piques everyone's curiosity, regardless of faith. My question is, do you think, let's say they, they go forward with um, carbon dating the shroud again, and it comes back first, and will that quote, like, end the article? Okay. Well, that's different, because I think we have people like that now who see it as historical evidence but don't have faith. So I didn't know why, you, if you were asking that. I, I think this is a question a lot of times of types of minds. Mm -hmm. Like, so like you're saying, like if you look at the science, and you, so I think what I've learned, and probably why ultimately I'm a filmmaker, even though I, I'm, I'm in academics now with, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Allison's my advisor, uh, who's a skeptic, I think. <laughs> but uh, is that when you look at images, the thing about images and painting is that they can tell types of knowledge all at the same time. So whereas being didactic requires a sequencing where you have to demote a certain type of knowledge because the lack of strength in history versus science, whatever, and being didactic as a filmmaker, a narrative, I could maintain with images and story the tension between how much of the science is still in that narrative, how much of the weight is being challenged by historical text, and I'm just saying the overall weight here is yeah. still arguing against the skeptics' arguments, I think with preponderance, but. If, if I may respond as well, I think um, I'm, I'm reminded of a certain agnostic by the name of Yves Delage, who came into contact with the shroud after it was known to be a photo document, where, where the grayscale is inverted. You don't arrive at a negative, but the positive. And so this agnostic writes a paper for the Académie de Sciences, and he, it, his conclusion is that the man of the shroud is Jesus of Nazareth, precisely because he sees it to be anatomically perfect. I wish I had the chance to go into all the details here, but um, that's his conclusion. Well, they don't publish his paper in the minutes. He writes to his colleague lamenting, had I been writing about Xerxes for some pharaoh, 
No one would have anything to say. I don't understand why they're scandalized that there be a material trace of Jesus' existence. Remember, he's not making faith claims when he says so. He's simply saying that the pathologies that we see here are anatomically just too convincing to ignore. Um, and so he comes to this conclusion. But I, I'm also reminded of another Frenchman who says this. This is Pascal. He says, with regard to Christianity, mind you, but I think it applies neatly to the Shroud too. He says, there is enough light for those only who wish to see. There's enough obscurity for those of a contrary disposition. It seems to me that we have a preponderance of evidence that points in the direction of authenticity. There was one good argument that went in the other direction. Any scientist worth his salt is gonna weigh that in the way that's obvious. Now we don't even have that one as the, 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 the carbon dating is shown to be utterly inconclusive. And so why cling? Why cling to this idea that it's medieval when uh, I think from an empirical scientist point of view, I, I grant you that the literature is, is more helpful, um, but the, from the empirical scientist, uh, scientist's point of view, I don't think we have any good evidence for the, a medieval date. Okay, last question from the audience. Oh, hi, my name is Nick. Um, I thought both of you made really compelling cases. Um, this question is mostly for Dr. Goodacre. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on the difference in the, the Gospels. You mentioned the Gospel of John and then Father Dalton. Father Dalton talked about how he used the different Greek word for the shroud, and I thought it was a really interesting point. And I want to make sure you got a chance to respond to that. I'm not sure you got a chance to actually respond to that, so that you know you could you you know bring your expertise to that that specific point. Uh, you know, thanks. I mean. Yeah, I mean, the, it's one of those cases where, I mean, I'm writing a book at the moment arguing that John knew the synoptic gospels, so I wish that John actually had the same words as the synoptics there, because it would help me. But um, I just think John is, is depicting a different kind of scene from the one that the Turin Shroud uh, presupposes. I, I mean, the idea that John would have used the word orthonia if he, if he thought that there was a bunch of linen cloths and a full body shroud, and a sudarian. That just doesn't that just doesn't ring true to me. So I think that's what I would like to say on that. It, sir, was there a reason it doesn't ring true? I'm not sure I follow. I mean, I, I well, because you would say, given given that the author of the fourth gospel is so precise about saying there were these orthonia and there was a sudarian, right. he wants to say there was this kind of material and there was this. He would also have said, oh, by the way, there's this massive shroud as well. It's got Jesus' face on it. I mean, oh, sorry, I'm being right. slightly facetious again, yeah, yeah. but I mean, it, that's a massive oversight, given the way that John tells that story, it seems to me. One final question for the group. Um, where do we go from here? <laughs> uh, this is Holy Week, so in terms of personal formation, the spiritual significance of the show, but we're also in an academic environment. We have multiple New Testament scholars here. I mean, should, should we look at the teaching of New Testament differently in light of the Shroud? Whichever of those two questions you wish to answer. Um, yeah, I, I go back to what I was saying before. I think as someone who believes in nat natural revelation, it's a different relationship to knowledge, is special revelation. But if someone believes in natural relation, then that, um, if they're, if to believe there is a God is also to believe that God is interactive with nature, maybe to differing degrees than revelation. But if that was the case, I think science is wide open and natural discoveries are wide open to also attest to the truth of Christianity. So for me, looking forward, I think it could be a fifth gospel. I see it more as. Um, obscure just enough to put at bay wildly skeptical people. And Dr. Goodegg is backing up everything he's saying, so I'm not accusing him. But, but like wildly skeptical people get to dismiss it offhand. I think it may it it, it opens the door for a, a new apologetic toward the very conversation that leads to who was this person in the first century, and then let you deal with your conclusions from there. Yeah. Well, I, I'd say. Um, from a very personal point of view, you know, where do we go from here? Um, I can tell you where I went from here. Like, I have this image in my 
prayer corner in my room. I think that there is that question, who is, who do you say that I am? For me, it, 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 uh, it draws my heart as well. So I'm not gonna pretend that aspect away. I think that's actually a plus. I don't think that we are second rate Christians just because we don't live in the first century. It seems to me, you know, that question that came from the Greeks, we want to see Jesus. I think everybody wants that. I think, uh, like Augustine says, it, it, you know, Lord, you made us for yourself. Our hearts are restless until they rest in you. If you gave that privilege to look upon Christ's face to that, those first century followers, might he have left uh, a trace of his even physical appearance to the rest of us? That doesn't seem beyond um, uh, reasonable. And moreover, I think it's remarkable that it encapsulates the two central mysteries about Christ, namely uh, the incarnation, that he who is God took on a human nature so as to accomplish our redemption by his loving sacrifice and death. Uh, it's a dead body we see on the shroud, but moreover, it didn't remain in death. Uh, he rose, and so could it be that this image actually attests to the resurrection as well? If so, I might have asked Jesus for a lot of different photographs that might have looked cool, like Jesus walking on the water or being transfigured on the mountain. But what he gave us, perhaps, is more essential for the Christian life. Paul would say, look, if, if Christ isn't raised, your faith is in vain. Um, I, I think that's a, a, weighty, a weighty thing to say. And so it strikes me as utterly reasonable that if Jesus wanted us to believe in this, he actually gave us means to do so. To, um, could it be that the, the science that has come through our day, now exposed in our day, is precisely for our generation? That wants image and wants science and could it be that Jesus, as he accommodates the doubting Thomases of his time, well, accommodates those of ours as well? Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Good Acre, you get the last word. Oh, great. I'm not, that's, uh, that's, 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 uh, that's not right. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's a hard one, isn't it? Because anybody who is a person of faith obviously always wants more. You know, I mean, I, I mean, every time there's a new discovery, I mentioned the Gospel of Jesus' wife, I wanted that to be authentic. I hope that there is someone eventually digs up, you know, the Edgerton Gospel, which we've only got little fragments of. I hope someone finds, you know, something else wonderful. I, I mean, the thing that something like grappling with the Turing Shrine helps you with is it helps you to say to yourself, well, what does it mean? This is why the question about well, what if the carbon dating came back to the first century? It helps you to grapple with that because it makes you say, well, okay, how would I react to that? And I think there are a lot of people who would be disappointed. That's, in, that's the interesting thing. I actually would be very excited. Mm -hmm. I would have to go, well, hold on a minute. But, but what about all these other things? And, and I'd actually have to do a lot of rethinking. But then again, you know, that's what scholarship encourages you to do all the time. Isn't it? Go back, rethink, challenge yourself, and, and debate. This has been a fabulous panel. Please join me in thanking our panelists for this excellent panel. Thank Father Juan Jose for sponsoring this event. If you still have questions, please join us. We're going to be here as long as you want us to be to answer your questions. Okay. All right, there you have it. I just watched the video myself and wanted to share some follow-up thoughts um, about this great debate. I think that this is the kind of thing we'd love to do more of. It's, um, it's useful, isn't it, to hear two different points of view and I think it really brings out the strengths of each side when they, you get to kind of expose them to scrutiny from someone who doesn't hold the same view. Now, what came out um, most, it seems to me, was, and this is not surprising, we're both in the world of biblical interpretation. And so what came out most, what it seems to me, as a point of contention, was John chapter 20 and the issue of how to interpret this language of the othonia. That's the Greek word that gets translated linen cloths. And so did you notice that um, at one point during the, uh, the, the debate, uh, Dr. Mark Goodacre said something like this. He said he thinks that John used Luke. So John knew Luke's gospel and, and used it as a source. Now, I wish he could have explained that more, and I, I, I would love to unpack this further. But um, that's a really interesting and significant point of view. And I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Goodacre has examined 
um, Luke vis-a-vis -vis John on this particular question. He, he didn't address Luke. And uh, Mark, if you're watching, I'd love to have this conversation with you in the future. Maybe we can meet um, for coffee at the SBL and, and talk this out. But can we look at that together real quick? Because I think this is just so important to the questions that became central in this conversation of ours. Um, so let's start with Luke's gospel. Start with the burial. This is recounted in Luke chapter 23, verses 50 and following. There it talks about Joseph from Arimathea, who's a member of the Sanhedrin, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. Well, this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had yet been laid. There's the key verse, verse 53. Joseph takes down the body of Jesus and wraps it in a sindon. Okay, that's the language in Greek. And it gets translated in the singular, a linen shroud. That's what's there on Friday night. Okay, but if you just read um, to the next, um, the, the next three verses, you'll arrive upon chapter 24, which of course recounts the resurrection. And look at what is now uh, the language that we find in the moment uh, that at early, at early dawn, um, going to now to the tomb, what do they find? Well, the stone is rolled away. Uh, the body isn't there. Uh, two men stood by in dazzling apparel. Why do you seek the living amongst the dead? He's not here, but is risen. Okay, and uh, it tells us um, that Peter rose and ran to the tomb in verse 12. This is the key, the key line. It says, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. Okay, linen cloths. This is the exact language that we're going to find in, in John. We also find in John this detail of him stooping. I think that's really interesting. Remember, uh, Dr. Goodacre's position is that there is a literary relationship between John and Luke, and it's that um, John is using Luke as his source. Well, what does his source say? Well, remember, in the moment of burial, Jesus' body is laid inside of a syndon, a linen shroud. Just 12 verses later, 24 and verse 12, when Peter goes to the tomb to, to, to look for the body, he doesn't find the body, but he does find the linens, the linen cloths. Okay, so tell me, is it not the most natural reading to understand that the linens that are discovered on Sunday morning are, are the, include <laughs> at least that linen that was there on Friday night? In other words, um, if we have a singular on Friday and then a plural on Sunday morning, um, in that very tomb, in, that, in the very circumstance of linens that wrapped the body of Jesus, is it not quite obvious that contained in the linens um, is the, the, the singular linen that, sh that also uh, wrapped the, the body on Friday? Seems to me that's, uh, that's easy to understand. Uh, I had a linen shroud. I discovered linens on Sunday. These are not totally different and non-overlapping category uh, or w words. No, they, they refer to uh, one and the same object. Uh, sure, we get extra details in that now on Sunday, he, he goes on to add that there are uh, other cloths as well besides the long syndon that wrapped the body. But uh, I, I don't see what's problematic about that reading. It seems to me that that's rather um, on the surface. I don't think you have to stretch very far from the, from the biblical data in order to reach this, this conclusion. Um, is, is it an inference? Yeah, yeah, it's an inference. Um, but it's an inference that based on uh, some, some detail that's in the text, in other words, not a mere argument from silence. There are there's reasons to believe this, given that um, two passages reveal two different words, but always with reference 
to the one burial of Jesus. And so that makes sense to me. Um, I would love to hear if, if uh, there's a different reading that uh, Dr. Goodarker would offer. But now just compare this language to, to John. Okay, and this is, this is what needs to be done, and I don't think has been done. Um, so if it we're in John chapter 19 and verses 38, and that's where we hear again Joseph of Arimathea, who um, asks Pilate um, that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission, and then he goes with Nicodemus also, um, who brings this these aloes, um, and they took they, that is Joseph and Nicodemus, took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices. This is remarkable. I wonder if Dr. Goodacre has noted this. Notice that it is the plural word that Joseph of Arimathea took the body of Jesus and bound it in othonia. Okay, that is the Greek word. Um, remember, what did Luke have in this very same circumstance when Joseph is burying the body? Not othonia, but uh, syndom, the singular word. So it seems that John, again, on Goodacre's theory that, that he's using Luke as a source, he feels perfectly happy interchanging the term othonia for syndom. He felt justified in, in making this... Uh, uh, equation, I suppose. Um, so, so why why are we having such a hard time with it? If someone who's so close to the scene, the very one recounting this detail, he has no problem substituting the word Othonia for Sindo, on the theory that Luke is his source. All right. So um, then, when you just read a couple verses down, you arrive to chapter twenty, and there, of course, we we read in verse five that um, stooping to look in, Peter saw the linen cloths lying there. There's the Othonia. He saw the very thing that he placed there on Friday. Okay, so again, that's that's my reading of Luke. It's perfectly consonant with the, the, the very language of John, which equates the linen cloths that are placed on Friday with the linen cloths that are placed on Sunday. Okay, so I'm not sure why we're imagining um, totally separate things. Remember, um, Dr. Goodacre said something to the effect that if John wanted to describe um, a long sheet, he would have said so. Um, it, he would not have used the word linen cloths. Okay, do, do, do you see how that, that doesn't seem to hold water based on the segue from the burial given its language, into the discovery of the empty tomb on Sunday. All right, I, I don't want to belabor the point. I think it's it's clear, um, and I don't mean to um, dominate the conversation. I wish I could have gone on uh, with Dr. Goodacre at the debate itself. If, if you noticed, I asked that question to him um, when, when he, he he's kind of leaned into this idea. Surely, surely... John would not have used this language if he meant to indicate um, a singular shroud. Um, he would have used a singular word. He would have used a different vocabulary. And, and I asked, uh, why? Why? And then um, the, the response that, that he gave, I found utterly un unsatisfactory, but it just wasn't the place to <laughs> draw out the conversation. And that's, that was kind of a shame. I wish we could have... Um, gone back and forth a little bit more about that. It, had I had the opportunity, this is what I would have said. I'm putting it out there um, in case um, Dr. Goodacre or others want to respond. I'd love to engage in a conversation about it. This is this is just my uh, me sharing with you um, what I would say in response. And uh, I welcome I welcome the feedback um, from Dr. Goodacre, from, from anyone else really, um, if they have a different reading, a, a better alternative than the one I'm suggesting here. I'll just ever so briefly comment the, the other things that, that came up as, as little points of contention. Um, Dr. Goodiger mentioned this idea of it's not really an archaeological object, see, because usually it's something dug up out of the ground. Um, and I, did, 
that was the first time I ever heard that particular argument. Uh, that's that's interesting to me. I did look up in Merriam-Webster's dictionary um, this this very point, and there in the dictionary it didn't require um, anything about excavation uh, beyond the term archaeology, but it, it just it could be an archaeological object might have anything to do with um, the origins of man. In fact, I'll go ahead and look it up right now with you, just because I don't have it. Webster Dictionary. All right, and let's look up the word. Um, let's look up the word archaeology and see what it says. Archaeology. It says one: the scientific study of material remains of past human life and acti activities. And it gives some examples, tools, pottery, jewelry, stone walls, and monuments. Yeah, so I like that. That sounds perfect. That's how I was using the term. Okay, and then two, um, he said, um, there, there are other sh there's another shroud from the first century. And say, look, it's nothing like the shroud that we have. Right, but is that really so surprising? Like. Who is it that we just read is the one procuring the shroud? Is it not Joseph of Arimathea, a very wealthy man, a member of the Sanhedrin? Right, so not every commoner is going to have the same uh, means at their disposal for their burial. That, that's, that's exactly the data. Jesus is being buried by the elite, the upper crust, um, not like absolutely everybody. So that, to my mind, is simply not a... A strong argument. Um, there was this idea of the, the hands don't look anatomically perfect to Dr. Mark Goodacre. He spent a lot of time, he says, looking at the hands. Um, there I'd simply point to the work of, of, of a surgeon, right? Who's These are people who have expertise in the field. They're the ones that are happy to say they find this perfection. Yves Delage, for example, is um, writing for the Académie de Sciences. He's not, he's not a believer. He has no problem talking about the anatomical perfection. Um, I would say, I'm, I don't know if this is the case of why Dr. Goodacre thinks that it doesn't look um, anatomically accurate, but it, of course the hands, there, there is um, soft tissue that covers the carpals, right? These are the phalanges, the, the fingers themselves, the carpals, and then the metacarpals. So it might look like these are really long fingers. If you were imagine, if you see only the skeleton here that shows these, these bones, and it, it looks like they're accentuatedly long uh, fingers. Um, but again, that's actually conforms to the anatomy of the human hand. If you want to read about this a little bit more, I would suggest the work of Pierre Barbet. That's B-A-R-B-E-T, a doctor at Calvary. Um, more recently, a forensic uh, doctor um, who wrote about this is Frederick Zugaby, and he has a book about the anatomical... Um, pathologies studied by the man of the shroud. Okay, um, so um, also I, I, I do take uh, Dr. Goodacre's point about, uh, he said, oh, well, it's not unexpected that there are different theories of how a forger might have made it and that they don't agree. This is always the case in all kinds of science that people have different theories um, and they don't agree. That's normal. Of course, that is normal, but that I, I grant you, <laughs> I, I grant you that, Dr. Goodacre, but uh, he didn't chime in on a particular version of forgery. He didn't weigh in to say, I think it's a painting, or no, no, I think it's a, uh, a scorch, I think it's a rubbing, I think it's a, a photograph. Um, okay, so my, my only point would be to say, well, well, which one do you think it is? Are you defending any particular theory? Or are you just kind of wanting to defend, generically, I defend that it is the work of, um, it, it is human artwork of, of some kind, and I just don't know what that is. Uh, fine, fine, that's, that's reasonable, one can defend that. And I think uh, it's just um, very noticeable, let's say, that there is no consensus on any one of those theories and there is consensus from the STIRP scientists that it's not any one of them, okay? So I think that's important to say, that those who had hands-on experience and that tested all viable theories, they came to a consensus to say it's not any one 
of those proposed theories. It's not human artwork. Okay, so um, that's what I would that's what I would say um, in response. I thought it was a great debate. I'm so happy that we had the chance to do it, and look forward to more of this in the future. Drop a comment here. Let me know what you thought were uh, my weak points. Um, I I would greatly appreciate that actually because um, I hope to do more of this in the future. And hey, if this is the the real deal, it ought to be able to withstand the scrutiny. And I think I welcome I welcome the scrutiny uh, in pursuit of the truth. And uh, I'm sure Dr. Mark Goodacre would say the same. Same. He was extremely cordial as always. Uh, I love his style. I, I love his work. And I'm just so happy that he, he gave the opportunity to have this great conversation. Hope you enjoyed. Um, Hope to see you back soon here on this channel. All right, talk to you soon, guys. God bless you.